Phil Chapman is a scientist and an astronaut, and if this combination doesn't make him unique, the fact that he's from Australia does. Dr. Chapman is the only foreign-born scientist astronaut in the American manned spacecraft program. Phil Chapman, who is 34, was educated in Sydney. After working in Sydney, the Antarctic and Canada, he was a staff physicist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology when he joined NASA in 1967. Terry Brown reports. He's a frequent visitor to the flight line at Allington Air Force Base near Houston in Texas. With more than two years of training as an astronaut already behind him, he's come a long way from the days when he flew Tiger Moths with the Sydney University Squadron. Dr. Chapman is now a proficient pilot of these supersonic jets, trained by American Air Force instructors and as such qualified to begin preparation for actual space flight. It'll be at least a year or two before Phil Chapman is chosen for a space mission. And until that time, he'll spend long hours training and studying here, a few miles from Ellington at the Manned Spacecraft Center. This is the nerve center of America's space program. The quiet, campus-like atmosphere conceals a bewildering technological complex, most of which our cameras were not able to film because of activities connected with the current Apollo flights to the moon. Practically everything an astronaut must do in space, from blast off to splashdown, is planned and simulated here. Most of it begins in the classroom. Phil Chapman has brilliant academic credentials, including a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Mathematics from Sydney University, and a Doctorate of Science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. But from the moment he entered the space program in August of 1967, the learning process began all over again. Phil, you're one of a new breed of astronaut, the scientist astronaut. What motivated you and what qualified you to join this select group of men? Well, basically, the qualification for being a scientist astronaut is a doctorate in some suitable field of science. Uh, what motivated me to join the program is that I was deeply interested in space technology. I was in this country uh, so that I could work in space technology. Uh, NASA called for applicants to become scientist astronauts and that's as close as you can get to space technology and so I, said, I applied. I was fortunate enough to be selected. Well, what's the difference between a scientist astronaut and an astronaut? I believe none of the scientist astronauts have yet flown. None of the scientist astronauts have been in space yet. The pilot astronauts are typically test pilots and their function is to develop the hardware our function is to go up there and use the hardware for scientific purposes. Do you have any special pride in being an Australian-born astronaut? Yes, I think I do. Uh, I'm delighted to have been an Australian. I'm American now. Uh, I don't feel that, that it's particularly significant in terms of my, what I'm doing in the program, but it's a matter of sheer chance, but I'm happy it turned out that way. I believe you joined the program just after the tragic Apollo 1 fire which killed Grissom, White and Chaffee. Did you have any second thoughts at that time? It, it happened that I was in Sydney at the time of the fire and I was, in fact I was at a picnic on at D. White with my parents when we heard on the radio about the fire. And uh, I was certainly upset because I knew a couple of the, those astronauts who were killed fairly well. And my parents were a little worried about the, the prospect, but I think that it didn't affect my intentions in any way. I've uh, also known a lot of pilots who have killed themselves and, and it's never deterred me from flying. There are nine scientist astronauts in Dr. Chapman's group, all of them similarly qualified. They were chosen originally from 900 applicants. As with most aspects of their training, they study together. These men will pioneer a program in space with much broader horizons than the present one. They will man American space stations, self-contained laboratories capable of orbiting for weeks or months and eventually years. The interior will look something like this, a great deal more commodious than the present cramped quarters of Apollo capsules that are designed for short voyages to the moon. For scientists like Dr. Chapman, the space stations will offer a place to study the stars above the distorting atmosphere of Earth, a matchless laboratory for experimentation and a new vantage point for observing Earth's geology, oceans and vegetation. The American prototype of a space station, created out of the third stage of a Saturn V rocket, 
is not scheduled for launching until 1972. A fully-fledged American station that will hold up to 12 men is not expected before 1976. It's a frustratingly long wait on the sidelines, but Dr. Chapman believes that when the program does become a reality, scientific research in space will return very lost. tangible earthly benefits. We'll learn to understand man's environment on Earth enormously better from, from the capability of long-term uh, synoptic as real-time observations of, of what's going on on Earth. And For example, we will probably be able to, to uh, gather information which is, will be of great value to the control of air pollution around cities. Apart from manufacturing, which I mentioned, I think we will be in having uh, direct We'll have television transmitters in orbit direct, broadcasting directly to individual homes by the end of the next decade. I think that we will have, it is possible that, that at the level of expense I'm talking about, that we'll actually have tourism in, in orbit. At $10 a pound, certainly, it becomes feasible to think about spending your vacation in Earth orbit. And I think that the, I believe that certainly by the mid-80s there will be hotels in Earth orbit. And it'll be the place to go. So apart from the... Uh uh, the fact that we may have tourists joyriding around space, do you think there'll actually be colonization of other planets in outer space? I would say that for quite a long while there will be colonization only in the sense that there is colonization of Antarctica, that is that there are permanent bases. Uh, on the moon, I expect we will have permanent bases within 10 to 15 years. On other planets it'll take longer. Eventually, I'm totally convinced that man is going to spread out from this planet and this planet is going to be just a the place where it all started and, and of the same sort of significance to to man out in space as Britain is to Australia right now. Dr Chapman has had a taste of the difficulties of physically adjusting to the totally foreign environment of outer space. One of the first tests was the altitude training chamber, a metal tank where the astronauts are subjected to rapid changes in atmospheric pressure. The reactions are carefully monitored for signs of ailments that could be dangerous during actual space flight. Unusual experiences are not uncommon for a man who once spent two years on the Antarctic ice, but this is one that comes only from being an astronaut. It looks like fun, but coping with weightlessness requires a lot of skill and energy. It can only be simulated for 30 second intervals within a specially equipped jet aircraft. This group wasn't learning gymnastics, but how to feed themselves without the help of gravity. Phil Chapman has undergone survival courses for desert, jungle and water. Among the many hazards faced by the astronauts is landing in the wrong place or the wrong way. In this realistic training sequence, an Apollo capsule is dumped upside down into a tank of water so the normal hatchway is submerged. The astronauts learn to calmly exit through the cone emergency hatch, swim to the surface and wait in a rubber raft until help arrives. Home life is an all too scarce commodity for an astronaut. Phil Chapman, his wife Pam and their two children Peter 8 and Kristen 12 months recently moved into this modern home in Nassau Bay, an attractive garden suburb not far from the manned spacecraft centre. Now look at the Chapman family had to be from a distance since the National Magazine has exclusive rights to the private life of all the astronauts. The long hours and rigorous demands of an astronaut's training requires him to maintain peak physical condition. Phil Chapman supplements regular sessions of swimming, sailing or squash with a stiff workout on a makeshift track behind the astronaut's gymnasium. A quick shower and he usually heads directly back to building 4, the astronaut's headquarters. The third floor is a cluster of modern but rather austere offices where the astronauts research, prepare reports and deal with a surprisingly large volume of paperwork. So far, Phil Chapman hasn't had to bother with the kind of paperwork that swamps some of his more famous colleagues, though he says a few fan letters occasionally reach him from Australia. This is generally where he winds up a long day, poring over a desk full of research material. Phil, when and where do you expect to go into space? I think that I'll be, probably be involved in the Apollo Applications Program, which is the follow-on to the current lunar landing series. Uh, my field is physics, and my the experiments with which I'm most likely to be concerned are experiments which one would want to 
perform in zero g rather than on the lunar surface. It's conceivable that I might get to the moon in one of the very later flights, but I, my immediate involvement is likely to be in Earth orbit. So, the, and what actually will you be doing in, in Earth orbit, and how many people will be up there with you? If I'm in the Apollo Applications Program, I'll be a, one of a three-man crew, and we'll be doing a series of experiments which are connected with astronomy, solar physics, Earth resources. If I am in one of the later programs after the Apollo Applications Program, the next program is scheduled to have a 12-man space station, and then, we're, then that's becoming a much more luxurious and comfortable environment. Is it possible you may be on the first team that will go to Mars? Uh, they'll have to hurry up. <laughs> if, uh, if it were possible, I'd certainly, certainly be delighted to go. I think anybody would. It's a, it's a long trip. It takes about two years in space. And, uh, so it's comparable to going with Captain Cook, but uh, in a somewhat more comfortable way than, <laughs> than going with Captain Cook. But uh, I don't expect that we will be going to Mars until sometime in the 80s at the very earliest, and I think I'll probably be too old at that time.